This is a time of uh, tremendous violence of pandemics, both global and local, both health and economic. This is a time when it's hard to think about celebrating peace. And yet today, on a day the United Nations has declared an international day of peace, it's a great honor uh, to serve as a co-secretary general of one of the world's uh, leading peace associations, the oldest academic consortium of peace studies, scholars and researchers, professors and students, community members. As co-secretary general of the International Peace Research Association, I am deeply honored uh, to greet you all um, on this UN International Day of Peace. Let me just say a very brief word or two before we begin the proceedings. First, uh, IPRA has looked at this day as part of a very special partnership, uh, looking at silver linings in these COVID-19 times. We saw an opportunity to partner with our regional associations and to partner on this special day to look at the world from a point of view that we consider to be absolutely essential, cutting edge, to look at the world from the point of view of indigenous peoples and the roots of resistance movements. Because uh, to look uh, from an African point of view at the concept of Sankofa, to look backwards in order to look forwards, to look at our roots in order to look for deeper strategic and meaningful solutions for today, for tomorrow, and for seven generations forward, we believe that spotlighting uh, indigenous uh, philosophies, indigenous practices, indigenous history, and indigenous work is a leading way of thinking about peace, real peace, lasting peace uh, for the future. So uh, I could not be more thrilled uh, to have uh, our regional association, Peace and Justice Studies Association, the North American branch of IPRA, uh, serve as the main co-host of this event. And to have three of our four other regional associations uh, have leaders and representatives here on this panel. And you'll hear more about the African Peace Research and Education Studies Association, the Asia Pacific Peace Studies Association, and the Latin American Council on Peace Education later in today. Uh, but I guess uh, the last thing I wanna say uh, from this special vantage point uh, of, of the center of IPRA is that uh, not only do we have some wisdom from around the world, but we have um, speakers, uh, four speakers uh, that are uh, amongst the people who I either know to be, because I've worked with them, uh, extraordinary, extraordinary uh, individuals, insightful, beautiful, uh, and inspiring. So I, I can't wait to actually sit back and listen to them. But without further ado, I want to also say that I'm, I'm very pleased and honored uh, to have uh, as co MC a dear friend, a beloved, uh, trusted uh, colleague and comrade, who serves not only uh, as a leader of PGSA, but as the chief PGSA liaison to the International Peace Research Association. She also, as I think she will self-introduce, uh, is rooted in her own indigenous Cherokee heritage. And um, well, she's also one of the professors of my son. So like in all things, there's a family connection, there's a personal and political connection there's a way in which even in these times when we can't actually hug each other, we keep these connections strong. So I will uh, pass the baton over uh, to Polly Walker, who will take us to the next steps. I'm speaking today from the homelands of the Onyata Aga, and I acknowledge the people of the Standing Stone, the Oneida Nation, and their elders past and present. Chicharagi, Daxi Dakwadoela, Tohirairi I'm of Cherokee descent, my Cherokee name is Thuxi, and I hold forth the vision that we may all live together in peace. 
As we address Indigenous peacemaking and the current crisis, I've been reflecting on the ways in which Indigenous peoples around the world are resisting imperialism, settler colonialism, capitalism, and westernization. And in those reflections, I draw on the Cherokee creation story of Shelu, the Corn Mother, and her teachings about respect, reciprocity, and relationality, both among humans and between humans in the natural world. Those attitudes and actions are marginalized and silenced across the majority of the non-Indigenous population. And we see the effects of that in the kinds of climate change we're facing. This week in New Mexico, in the lands that grew me up, hundreds of thousands of birds fell dead from the sky. I remember Cherokee stories that tell us what happens when we do not have respect and reciprocity and relationality. We have Cherokee stories that tell of the time when humans disrespected all of the animals and the animals met together in a great council and said that the humans, the five-fingered ones were disrespecting them and sent all kinds of diseases upon humans. And I also remember from our Cherokee stories that our plant relatives took pity on us and they sent medicines for all the illnesses that befall us. So today, we remember this respect, relationality, and we call on indigenous peoples and their ways of knowing to restore balance and harmony to our cosmos. So Matt, over to you again. We have um, a special message sent to us. We weren't sure what form it was going to take uh, because uh, we just got it fairly recently, but um, this is uh, two people, uh, a father-daughter combination, who received uh, one year ago from the Peace and Justice Studies Association two uh, rewards that, uh, awards that are not usually related, but that year it was uh, appropriate. Um, Negan and J uh, James Sinclair and uh, Sarah Fontaine Sinclair uh, were the 2019 PGSA Peace Educator of the Year and Next Generation Leader of the Year. And they have uh, sent to us a special greeting uh, to open our time together uh, from the North Country in uh, the lands now known as Canada. Uh, my name is uh, Nigon Sinclair. Nigon Wewudum Nijishna Kos Namago Shindo Dem. And Nimen Wendem Omayayan. Bonjour, Nimijin Abekwe Nijishna Kos Namago Shindo Dem. My name is Sarah Fontaine Sinclair. And my Anishinaabe name is Nimijin Abekwe, which means the light that dances on the water. And we are the uh, 2019 Peace Educator of the Year. And you are? The next generation peacemaker of the year. <laughs> and we're so honored to come join you virtually uh, for the Peace and Justice Studies Association. Uh, we know uh, that you were just last year here in Treaty 1 territory. And so uh, we miss you. Treaty 1 misses you. Treaty 1 is thinking about all of you as we uh, go through this horrible pandemic and this uh, very big disruption to our lives. But we also uh, want to send our best wishes to anyone who is experiencing any of the sickness or the impacts of the sickness. We ourselves had a family member who passed away uh, due to COVID-19. And so we, uh, we send out our love to all of you and our best wishes. Uh, what we want to talk about today is uh, send our good thoughts to today's panel called The Roots of Our Resistance, Indigenous Peacemaking and the Current Crisis, and uh, give you an update, a little update on how things have been going for us here uh, in Treaty 1, uh, Manitowoc, and uh, tell you a little bit about some of the stuff that's been happening. Um, right now, as I speak to you, uh, I'm just going to share a screen for just a moment here. Um, you can see that we are currently going through a crisis uh, in this country in regards to Indigenous traditional practices for our Mi'kmaq relatives. Uh, while Sarah and I are both Anishinaabe, um, our relatives come from the Abenaki Confederacy on the eastern coast of uh, Turtle Island. And uh, we, of course, uh, think very deeply about our Mi'kmaq relations who are simply expressing their right 
to fish and to uh, take care of their families and support their families as they have done for thousands of years and have been recognized since the 17th century as having a treaty with uh, the settler nation that we now share with Canada in order to uh, express our right and continue our ways. Uh, and so currently they are under assault from um, people, other fishermen, um, other government people, uh, police officers and others who are uh, withholding them from their rights, even though they have been recognized by the Supreme Court in which to have those rights. And it is a perfect example of what I think is the ongoing crisis uh, in this country in regards to Indigenous rights and what we are going to see increasingly as the pandemic continues its march across uh, time and across uh, these territories. We have an ongoing issue involving the use of lands and resources and that Indigenous rights have always been those things that have protected lands and environments and waters but are now seen as a hindrance and they're seen as a problem and they will then be criminalized as they are currently in the eastern coast with our uh, Mi'kmaq relations. Um, that is exactly the kinds of things that our panel will speak about for today um, in relation to Indigenous peacemaking and how do we think about making peace. Um, and one of the most important things, of course, is we must listen to all those who are impacted by uh, the situations that, have, that laws and colonialism and historical legacies of injustice have created for us. And the most important, of course, is our youth. And so we have our youth right here. Uh, one of our uh, most important voices uh, in our family, uh, also one of our most important voices amongst young Anishinaabe Kwe here in Treaty 1 territory, and uh, a person who I have deep respect for, except for when she doesn't listen to me. <laughs> When she doesn't do the dishes, then then she's, that's it. Your rights are over. Go up to your room. <laughs> uh, that being said, I'll hand you over to uh, Namiji Nibakwe, Sarah here, who uh, has prepared some stuff for you. So go ahead, take it away, Sarah. Um, I'm going to read a bit from a paper because I wanted to make sure that I got everything that I wanted to say down. Um, so as you, as my dad has said, my name is Sarah. I'm an Indigenous climate and social justice activist, but that's not only who I am. I'm also a daughter, a niece, a student, a teen, a human being. When I was little, I used to dream of being a princess. Now I dream of living in a world with clean air and unpolluted oceans. I know the world is pretty messed up right now because of COVID and all the climate crisis and, but, and, and all, but the climate pr crisis is still going on. It doesn't just stop because there's a pandemic. I know in some places, pollution and greenhouse gases are lessening every day because people aren't living their usual busy lives. And I think that's so great. Maybe even more than great, but the world, so the world is taking a break, but we have to remember that when we go back to normal, whatever that's going to be, um, that's just because all of this is happening doesn't mean that we get to go back to our wasteful ways. If we go back to what has happened before, it'll just be the same as before. To all the adults watching, us kids know what is happening. We know what is happening to the earth right now. In fact, we are the ones trying to inform you on the climate catastrophe. We have been yelling and shouting at all of you. We have shown you all the proven science, the true facts, yet we see no urgency from the people in power. We are trying to make futures for ourselves. Kids shouldn't have to drop out of school to argue with politicians whether science is real or not. Kids should not have to yell and scream to secure a future that should have already been secured by past generations, not destroyed by them. There are 10 years remaining between us and the breaking point when we cannot reverse anything to do with climate change. I'm done with being told that I'm too young. I'm done with waiting, waiting for things to be done for me. I'm going to shout and scream from everywhere I can and the next generation's futures. I'm, it's time to act. History is watching all of us right now. Great. So we watch Sarah for that. Um, I mean, pretty 
uh, we can feel pretty negative about lots of things and pretty sad about the pandemic and we can feel very frustrated with the way the world is at the moment but when we um, hear the voices of our youth we uh, we get very you know you can only help but uh, get inspired by uh, the kind of vision and that the world will be in good hands with people like Sarah as we go forth in the future I like that you nodded to that yeah <laughs> Probably better than the way we left it. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, we want to send everybody best wishes and good thoughts. And uh, if there's any hope that comes out of uh, this time period in which um, there's so many things that this period has taught us. Uh, and one of the most important things that it's that this time period has taught us, eh? uh, we were talking about this the other night, is uh, COVID-19 has really taught us about the, the power of family and the power of community and how important it is to love one another. And who taught everybody that? That was indigenous peoples who, yeah. you know, with treaty and with other uh, ways that we think of relationships. One of the most important teachings that we have is that everyone matters and that everybody has a place and everybody has a role to play in society. And in order for our nation to work, everybody must contribute. Everybody must bring a little bit to the feast. And so, uh, Part of this is by uh, taking care of yourself and taking care of your own health. And by doing that, you inevitably take care of the health of others. And so we think a lot about those teachings today. And, and what else has COVID-19 taught you, sir? To spend more time with family. And tons of time with her father. <laughs> it's like, it's it's like a, a dream much. come true for her. <laughs> too much? What are you talking about? It's like a dream come true. How many puzzles have we done? Many. <laughs> <laughs> we even did a puzzle. My sister got us a puzzle of us, of Sarah and I. So we actually did a puzzle of our own faces. Yeah, it was a bit creepy. <laughs> and so one of the other things that uh, that this COVID-19 taught us is all about taking care of the earth too. And, and we, we can't just re return to normal as Sarah indicated in her speech. Uh, one of the things that COVID-19 reminded us of is when the initial days of the pandemic happened, uh, an industry shut down, particularly in places like China, also in Europe and in North America. Um, the amount of carbon uh, monoxide in the atmosphere, the number of, uh, of pollutants uh, in the atmosphere reduced up to 60% virtually overnight, which tells you how quickly the Earth can take care of itself if we just get out of the way and we stop hurting it and we take care of one another. And like I said, if we take care of ourselves, we will inevitably also take care of those around us. That is the teaching that, um, that we offer to you today as Anishinaabe people over here. And uh, we also want to, um, you know, wish everybody luck and good thoughts for this year's conference. And if you, um, if you want to nominate Sarah for the Peace Educator of the Year Award, She's available. <laughs> I'm free. <laughs> <laughs> Just joke. But uh, much love to everybody. Thanks to all the organizers uh, for including us and to all of our fellow panelists for today. Uh, thanks to, to uh, Matt Mayer for, uh, for bringing us in today and reminding me this morning of getting this done. Uh, and so huge miigwech to all of you and take care. Miigwech, ego se. And thank you, uh, dear uh, Sarah and uh, Nick An. We begin now in earnest uh, our panel, uh, The Roots of Resistance, Indigenous Peacemaking and the Current Crisis. Uh, and we begin uh, not only with thanks to those who have come before, uh, but with thanks to everyone from every region of this planet that have helped make and are about to make uh, this uh, discussion, this conversation meaningful. Um, just as Nigan thanked me, Matt Myers, uh, and the International Peace Research Association, I will thank uh, Michael Lodenthal and Abby, who are doing the tech work here for Peace and Justice Studies Association, and quickly move to introducing the first of our speakers. But really, before even that, uh, our first speaker, uh, comes to us uh, from Colombia. And uh, though she understands, I think, uh, a, a lot of English, more, uh, more English than I understand Spanish and than I dare to speak, uh, she has uh, asked that uh, we have a translator uh, for her work. And our translator is not just someone 
who uh, who knows how to uh, you know speak from English to Spanish and back again. Uh, I'm so uh, thrilled to introduce uh, everyone to uh, Diana Marcela uh, Agudela Ortiz. Uh, Diana is a faculty of social and human sciences at the Externado University of Colombia in Bogota. But much more than that, Marcela uh, is really a, uh, a deep, deep uh, organizer, uh, thinker, researcher, writer, uh, who has done um, much of her work uh, on uh, the struggles in her own native Colombia, but has also done pioneering work on Palestine and other struggles around the world. Marcela is a leader of the Latin American Council on Peace Research, CLAIP, uh, which is the main uh, affiliate of IPRA in uh, South America. And by the way, I see the Secretary General of CLAIP on with us today. So hi, Marte. Uh, but Marcela is one of those within the leadership of CLAIP who also um, has been leading their work in deepening connections with youth and young people uh, and building youth leadership in the peace studies circles. So Marcella, much more than a, a translator and interpreter, uh, it's wonderful to have you here. Uh, Marcella will be interpreting for our first speaker. Uh, and as I say, um, I, I'm just going to say a few words uh, about who she is, if I can find the biography I had in front of me a second ago. Ah, yes. Uh, Dr. Adriana Anacona Munoz is an indigenous woman of the Yanacuna people of Colombia. She is a sociologist with a master's degree in public policy from the Universidad del Val. Adriana holds a doctorate in history and art with a specialty in peace and conflict studies from the University of Granada, Spain. She's worked with the Fund for the Development of Indigenous Peoples of Latin America and the Caribbean is a member of the Gishoa Research Group of the Santiago de Cali University. Uh, she's part of the Management and Public Policies Group of University del Val and of the Ibero-American Research Network for Imperfect Peace. Really, frankly, folks, if I were to read all of the different associations that Adriana is a part of, we would not have time for uh, uh, the rest of the conversation. But uh, Adriana's deep areas of research uh, include uh, work around history and gender, social organization and movements, peace building and pacifist empowerment, and the design, evaluation and analysis of rights-based public policies. She's a researcher, uh, she's a social scientist, and she's an advocate uh, and leader of her people. We are truly honored to have you here. Adriana, start us off. Thank you. Machikuna. Uh, eh, Yucapa Chuquita, Aldana Nacuna Muñoz, Colombia Manta, Yanacuna, Runa Mican. Buenas tardes, compañeros y compañeras, hermanos y hermanas. Mi nombre es Adriana Nacuna, como dice Matt, del pueblo Yanacuna de Colombia. Para mí es un honor estar con ustedes y compartir este espacio, porque además es una fiesta tradicional, como lo decía Poli, de juntarnos todos pero además del Quillarraimi, que es la fiesta a la luna. Por eso quiero compartir una presentación de nuestro sentir, como lo decía ella, del tejido que hacemos los pueblos indígenas ancestrales preexistentes. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm more than pleased to be here. My name is Adriana Anacona. I come from the Yanacuna people from Colombia. I'm quite happy to be here with you all in this special day, not only because I'm sharing this with you, but, but also because we're celebrating Kija Raimi. Kija Raimi is today the, celebrating the celebration of the moon uh, today, also the International Peace Day. So um, I'm, one, I'm pleased to share with you all brothers and sisters today. Mi lugar de enunciación o mi origen como indígena Yanacuna, me ha permitido durante 40 años entender que los vínculos se tejen y se tejen en familia, se tejen en comunidad y se tejen en dualidad entre hombres y mujeres para la pervivencia, protección o salvaguarda de nuestros pueblos. My enunciation place as an indigenous woman comes from my experience for almost 40 years with my community and family 
thinking about this uh, woven as the um, as the main point of bringing together people. We need to understand that this fabric is not just a communi community fabric, but also the core of the healing process in the community. Por eso, este panel para mí es una oportunidad de cuestionar la forma como nos miran o como intentan deslegitimar las luchas pacifistas que los pueblos indígenas desarrollamos en toda América Latina. Hoy en mi país se está marchando para defender la vida y es desde allí que quiero enaltecer su labor. So today is a big opportunity to question the ways of discrediting all our resistance of our, our pacific resistance, mainly by the media and the governments. Today, as we are speaking, there's a huge manifestation all over Colombia in this in this special manner. Entonces, para mí es una oportunidad de poder contribuir a las resistencias y a narrar nuestras propias historias. Y desde allí poder dar cuenta de esa capacidad transformadora de los conflictos, que aunque los medios de comunicación y algunos gobiernos nos quieren hacer ver como violentos, no lo somos. Somos creativos y estamos dispuestos a la pluralidad, al diálogo, para que nuestras luchas no sean distorsionadas frente a un modelo de economía extractivista que insiste cada vez más destruir a nuestra madre naturaleza, nuestra madre tierra o Pachamama. So by doing this, by questioning these ways of discrediting, we can recognize our own stories, our own transformative capacity that we have in the indigenous communities, and to recognize that we are not, as they called us, violent people, but we are creative, plural people, open to dialogue, and we're working against this distortion against us. In America Latina, somos más de 826 pueblos. En Colombia, 102. Más de 65 idiomas solo en Colombia. Y nos une la, ide la pluralidad en identidad, la cultura, el libre ejercicio de autodeterminación, la defensa del territorio pero también lamentablemente nos une las desigualdades, la persecución, el despojo y la muerte. So in Latin America we're talking about more than 826 different indigenous communities, just in Colombia 102 communities with 55 to 60 different languages. We're uh, together not only by our plurality, our culture, our self-determination, and the defense of territory, but unfortunately, we're also united because of the murder against us, the persecution, the dispossession, and the, the repression against us. In America Latina, o Yala, la tierra del florecimiento, existen procesos desde hace más de 50 años, procesos políticos organizativos de organizaciones como el Consejo Regional Indígena del Cauca, la UNIP, la CONAI de Ecuador y muchas otras organizaciones con más de 50 años que han demostrado la importancia que tenemos en la toma de decisión. Contamos con mandatos y con procesos de políticas públicas que exigimos deban ser escuchados. So, we are talking about more than 50 years of struggle and the organizations like CRIC, ONIC and CONAI in Ecuador that we have to honor because these uh, organization processes gives us today different mandates and norma normativity and the possibility of taking part on decision making and public policy actions as we do today. Como pueblo Yanacuna, del cual yo hago parte, hemos hecho proceso organizativo en el Consejo Regional Indígena del Cauca en la defensa del macizo colombiano. El macizo colombiano es donde existe, podría decir yo, la mayor reserva de agua, no solo de este continente, sino también del planeta. Y allí, más de 45 mil indígenas, estamos convencidos de su defensa. Nos hemos organizado en 31 comunidades, en seis departamentos en todo el país, 
para defender nuestra ancestralidad y el territorio. So in this long process of organization in the continent, we, the Yanacuna people, uh, work together with the Creek Association in the Cauca for the self-determination, but especially because of the defense of the land and the Macizo. The Macizo Colombiano has, it's probably one of the biggest um, water reserve, reservoirs in the planet. So we are talking about, about 45,000 people that are, that are recognized, that recognizes themselves as Yanacuna people in 31 communities in six different departments in our country. En esa defensa plural del territorio, hemos cuestionado los diferentes modelos de dominación y también la presencia de actores armados. Y por eso consideramos en nuestro pueblo que estas personas que nos han orientado en recuperar nuestra ancestralidad, la relación entre el mundo espiritual, el mundo material, el mundo de los saberes y el mundo de los afectos, deben ser consideradas como tejedoras de proceso, porque son ellas las que nos han permitido resistir y hacer acciones no violentas en diferentes escenarios. Okay, so one of our resistance in this pluralistic uh, space is about questioning uh, the presence of armed actors in our, in our territories and uh, criticizing these models of domination that comes uh, to our territories. A process weaver is uh, that uh, is who can uh, bring together these four points in the Chacana. You can see the red, uh, the red. Chacana <laughs> is like across with different uh, sites, but it has four special points. One coming from the spiritual world, one from the material world, one from the affection and sensitivity world, and one from the knowledge world. Who, whoever calls themselves process weaver has to weave and put all these things together in just uh, one fabric. All this, um, yeah, all, all this in just one piece of fabric. Y desde allí hemos trabajado en unidad, en tejido social y cultural, en la defensa del territorio, en la, recu recuperación, de, en la recuperación de la memoria ancestral, en la organización con otras, con otras organizaciones indígenas, en la aplicación de la norma, en la exigencia de nueva norma. So all these struggles bring us together uh, to the defense of territory, mainly the ancestral memory and um, recovering the historical context and bringing uh, normativity and regulations that allow us to safeguard, uh, to safeguard our knowledge. Por eso creemos que es importante denunciar en este espacio que en Colombia nos están matando, no solamente a los líderes y lideresas afrodescendientes y campesinos, sino también a los indígenas. En los últimos cuatro años hay más de 269 indígenas asesinados, 167 en este gobierno, 47 en este año y un poco más de 20 en este periodo de cuarentena. So this is why it's so important for us to denounce that just in the last four years, they, they've been killing us forever in our country, but especially in these last four years, there's more than 269 leaders killed between those years, 167 under the government of Ivan Duque, that is our current president, 47 in just in 2020, and uh, 14 during the COVID pandemic, but this data Uh, what was collected in June, we're talking about, about 22 to, today. Por eso en el contexto actual, para mí es una oportunidad poder convocar al trabajo en unidad, en hermandad, no solo en este continente, sino en todos, de tal manera que podamos trabajar en unión, en, sal, en sanar la madre naturaleza, el COVID lo ha demostrado. Nosotros tenemos muchos conocimientos en la medicina ancestral, en los procesos organizativos y también luchamos frente a los diferentes tipos de violencia. Por eso es mi llamado para que podamos seguir tejiendo en unidad. 
Adriana calls then for unity and what they, they've learned from COVID-19 situation is that they are not only united by inequity, but also because they denounce, but especially because there's the, this need of being together, of coming together. They've learned that they need to heal through traditional medicine, to heal for all this violence and to keep up in the, the, in the defense of life more beyond the, the short periods of encounter that we've to come together. And she would like to say that when they killed one person, one of these leaders, they killed the, a whole community. That's why we need to be um, together for this time. Yuvan Chani, y abrazo a todos desde el corazón para que podamos seguir tejiendo en unidad. Yuvan Chani. Thank you. Thank you all. Un abrazo fuerte. Gracias, Adriana. Gracias, maestra Marité. Gracias, gracias. Muchas gracias, Poli, todos. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias. Hala, you are muted, dear. Cough. I was trying not to cough into the microphone. Thank you. We're ready to segue to Matt Mogeko, and I have the honor of introducing him. And once again, it's a, a very long and distinguished list. He is associate professor and chair of the journalism department in the Park School of Communications at Ithaca College. Prior to coming to Ithaca, Matt taught at Bowie State University, Maryland, and has served as faculty member and administrator at universities in South Africa, Swaziland, Sierra Leone, and Nigeria. His research is focused on media and peace building, international communication, press freedom and sustainable development in Africa, and capacity building for media practitioners in developing countries. He is a member of the International Association for Mass Communication Research, the Association for Educa Educators in Journalism and Mass Communication, the African Studies Association, and the World Association for Christian Communication. In addition, he was a founding member of the Africa Peace Research and Education Association and served as an executive and council member of the International Peace Research Association. It's my honor to turn it over to Matt. Thank you very much, and good evening or good morning, everybody else. Uh, let me just add that it may not sound too nice, but I think I'm now a retired professor from Ithaca College. And I am back here in Maryland in, uh, in the USA, uh, doing some little bit of consultancy work, and also uh, doing some adjunct work at Howard University in Washington, DC. Uh, let me just say that, well, let me thank the organizers of this for inviting me. Uh, the Secretary General, the Co-Secretary General of IPRA, uh, our chief, Matt Meyer, uh, I've known him for years now. Uh, I feel very grateful that I was allowed to participate in this. Now, <sighs> My background, in, my background in peace research started way back in 1998 19, uh, when I joined IPRA in South Africa when I was there. And um, we were focusing more in the area of peace journalism for my commission. So I come from that background. But also there in South Africa, the University of the Northwest, I was also privileged to put heads together with some of my colleagues who decided that we should uh, look into uh, what they call the IKS studies program, which is the indigenous knowledge systems, IKS. And I found that very interesting. And I realized that there was so much to be learned from the African indigenous approach to doing almost everything. So tonight, I'm just going to talk about uh, following the, the directive of the organizers, the roots of our resistance, uh, indigenous 
peacemaking and the current crisis, I'm going to look at some salient points in the African situation. Because like I said, I'm originally from Nigeria, although I've lived in other African countries. I'm going to look at a peace uh, a building process, a peace building process in, in, in Africa, especially in Nigeria. What do we do? How have we been able to cope? Before I continue, I'd just like us to bear in mind some, uh, probably some six elements, some six items that will guide us in my remarks. The first one, of course, is going to be a combination of my communication background and my IKS background. But first of all, I would like us to bear in mind or keep at the back of our mind the element uh, of the dual nature of conflict the dual nature of conflict, which is that the fact that uh, we have two levels of conflict and we know how to deal with them and we'll come to that later. And the second point is that all conflicts, all conflicts are essentially communal. All conflicts are essentially communal or they begin as such. The third is the principle of progressive and regressive spirals in human communication. Progressive and regressive spirals in human communication. The fourth <clears throat> is the participatory decision-making process in conflict resolution and the search for peace. Participatory decision-making process in conflict resolution and the search for peace. The fifth is the crucial importance of the role of listening. I think somebody mentioned it at the beginning here that one important point in any conflict situation is our ability to listen to one another or to listen to each other. And the sixth one is what we parade as a big deal for us in Africa, coming especially from the Southern African subregion, which is the Ubuntu philosophy. The Ubuntu philosophy. Now, when you go back to Africa, and for me in particular to Nigeria, we have always lived in communities, whether they are uh, villages or towns or even cities. And uh, all the world is built up, made up of communities. And that is where the relevance of our approach to peacemaking and conflict resolution in Africa derives from. For example, we know that uh, uh, in small villages, we, we, in, in villages in Nigeria, for instance, generally, we talk about the fact that it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to raise a child. That is an, an, an appreciation, that is an appreciation of, um, that's just crazy. It's an appreciation of uh, the fact that uh, we, are, we are all um, together. We are all together when we have uh, problems in the community and we all put our thoughts together in dealing, in dealing, in dealing with it. Um, when I go further down here, let me start with this question of the phases of conflict or the two levels of conflict. According to Mark Anstey, which you all probably know about in 1991, he says that conflict exists in a relationship where parties believe that aspirations cannot be achieved simultaneously or perceive a divergence in their values, needs, and interests. At that level, where we are just in the thought process of disagreements, where we think we are different from others, but not done anything about it yet, we are talking about the latent level of conflict, the latent level of conflict. However, beyond that, beyond the latent level, when we purposely employ our power in an effort to defeat, neutralize, or eliminate each other to protect or further our interests in the interaction, then we're talking about manifest conflict. 
The point in this division is that a lot of conflicts at the latent level don't seem to be catching the attention of those of us who are involved in conflict resolution and peacemaking. We allow the conflict to get to the next level, which is the uh, uh, manifest level, and then we begin to run around. If we pay attention to disagreements at the very crucial level of the latent conflict, most of the conflict we see, which is manifest conflict, will not come to be. But unfortunately, uh, uh, let me bring in my, my journalism background here. Unfortunately, these kinds of conflicts that are at the latent level don't seem to attract attention because they are not exciting. They are not the kinds of things that make you say, oh my God, wow. But when it comes to the manifest conflict, we in journalism, for instance, and those of you who are in journalism, you know that uh, a, a first year journalism student is, is, is taught that one of the uh, 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 reasons or one of the things that make us cover any event, the newsworthiness of any event include things like RDT and all that, but necessarily conflict. When you cover conflict, and that is conflict at the manifest level, then it attracts attention, it attracts readership, it attracts listenership, it attracts viewership. And that is one of the problems we are facing, not just in Africa, but around the world. We allow latent conflict to pester to the level of manifest conflict, and that creates the problem. It has created the problem for us in Africa, it has created the problem for everybody in the world. Now, secondly, <clears throat> excuse me, we are talking about the fact that the world is made of communities. Yes, for us in Africa, we are very conscious of that. And I will relay you later to the, the, the story from a researcher in Nigeria about how a situation was settled among some of the uh, Igbo clans in Eastern Nigeria. But for now, the point I'm trying to make is that the world is made up of communities. And if we agree with our next door neighbor, with our next door neighbor, and begin to see the differences within us and amongst us, we would have been dealing with conflict at the latent level before it gets to the manifest level. And so we don't have to go into this level of destruction and all of the above. Then we go ahead to talk about the um, Ubuntu process, the Ubuntu philosophy, which is very familiar to those of you from Southern Africa, the Ubuntu philosophy. Simply put, the Ubuntu philosophy says that I am because you are. If we use that in all our interactions, I am because you are, then I wouldn't want to do anything to destroy you because in destroying you, I'm destroying myself. It's, it's kind of synonymous with the uh, Judeo-Christian philosophy of do unto others as you want them to do unto you or love your neighbor as yourself. These are the kind of guiding principles in our lives in Africa because we see ourselves in each other. We see ourselves in one another. And we don't want to destroy any relationship that we mean destroying ourselves. And then we, we uh, go on to this participatory thing, which is another common feature in African decision-making process. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, conflict management decision process. Because nobody wants to be uh, uh, undermined. Nobody wants to be seen as not being relevant to any process at all. So in many African countries, and especially in Nigeria, when you get to the community level and there's a crisis and you want to solve it, you want to get everybody to participate because the ability to maintain the peace we derive from our total agreement of the process that we have gone through. So usually 
when we want to settle a crisis situation or a conflict situation, we allow everybody to participate. Either everybody in terms of numbers or everybody in terms of representation. And in fact, the point is that every angle, every aspect of the society must be represented. I don't know whether you know this, but usually in, in many parts of the continent, but I know this particularly in Nigeria and among the Igbos in, in particular, if there is a conflict situation and it is beginning to look like impossible to be solved, then they call upon the women. The women take over. And when they take over, we create a situation that jolts everybody. Because what do they do? What do they do? They probably go half nude. And when they go half nude, what they are telling you is that we have reached the limits. We can't accept this anymore. And usually most of these uh, communities, when women go half nude or sometimes close to complete nudity, everybody listens. They listen to their complaint and they comply because they cannot afford to see their women go through that kind of torture, that kind of psychological torture. So way back, uh, I think about uh, 10 years ago, let me just give you an example, about 10 years ago, there was a crisis. There was a crisis in, in a place in Igbo land. And people tried, people tried to, people tried to uh, uh, resolve it. They did not. Two things, or three things really, helped in resolving the conflict. One, they went to the elders of both communities and say, let us talk. They agreed to talk. But when it looked like the, the, the talk was going to fail, they called on the women to come out and do the kind of thing I've just said. And when it was all settled, they wanted a symbol of settlement. In other words, they agreed, the two warring parties agreed to plant a tree, a fruit-bearing tree, at the boundaries of their communities so that that tree in the future will continue to be a reference point for the peace that they have arrived at. So these are the kinds of things we do. However, what has happened in the last 20, 30 years? Nigeria, for example, oil was discovered and outside interest started coming in to destroy the community relationship that we had. And these outside interests were coming to explore and exploit the oil, take the money away and give little or nothing back to the owners of the land. And there was resistance. That was the root of the resistance that caused what we call the Niger Delta crisis, where people were being killed and, and lands were being destroyed because there was an outside interference, outside socioeconomic interest that was more interested in siphoning money out of Nigeria than bringing it in to develop. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we had some Nigerians in governance who cooperated with them. So the resistance was not just only against the external exploiters, but also against the internal collaborators. So that was some of the roots of our resistance. Why can we have land that we depend on for fishing? I mean, water and land for fishing, for, for farming and all that, and somebody comes from outside the territory to exploit those resources, and they have collaborators amongst us. And that is why you heard of the big, big, big crisis in Nigeria, in the Niger Delta area. And it, 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 it went on and on to, other, some, to, to some other African countries too. What happened? Well, because of the resistance of people from those areas, they started listening. Okay, let's sit down. What is your problem? They should have done that even before they started the exploitation. They were not listening to the people. They were not uh, uh, interacting with the people. They were not identifying with the people because they were from 
outside the territory, they didn't see members of the community within the Ubuntu philosophy. They didn't see them as we are all in this together. They didn't see them as I see myself in you and you see yourself in me. So in our resistance, we are saying that we want to control our own thing by our own selves so that we can derive the full benefits, the full dividends of the mineral resources that we have. So, um, incidentally, we have the problem of uh, um, ethnicity, which has really created a problem for us because some people, like I said, that we have communities, the communities are either religion based or, 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 or the groups are uh, social economic based or they are uh, politically based and therefore people, other people from outside tend to exploit this situation. And that really creates the kind of conflict we have in Nigeria today and elsewhere. So uh, my, my submission today really is, 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 is very simple. That left to ourselves, we can manage our resources and we can divide them because in the past, we didn't have this big disparity begin, uh, uh, between the haves and have-nots. We were all in the problem or in the solution together. But with this kind of capitalist dispensation, capitalist motivation that we had from our side, it adulterated a lot of our cultural uh, 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 mega points and allowed people to exploit that and exploit us and create problems. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, we go back again to begin to reconcile our differences as people. Most importantly, to try to ignore those who come from outside to exploit us. But that is becoming more and more difficult. It's becoming really more and more difficult. And uh, we now realize, even given what is happening in the United States today, with, after the death of uh, uh, Floyd, this reconciliation coming together is possible. It's possible. You know the Ubuntu process help us deal with the, with the crisis in Southern Africa, in South Africa when we were, in fact, the uh, uh, Truth, and, Truth and Reconciliation Commission was built on the, on the principle of Ubuntu. And so I think there is still hope. For now, the level of westernization and the introduction of uh, 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 Western jurisprudence has created a problem for us. We now look up to outsiders for salvation of ourselves. And until we begin to turn around, until we begin to emulate other groups in other parts of the world who stand firm and do not allow themselves to be exploited, until we do that, we are going to continue to have the kind of crisis we have, in spite of the fact that we have indigenous ways of dealing with conflict. Those ways are going to be dismembered if we continue to look outside. For instance, we have food in Nigeria but we keep importing the same thing we have because some people want to exploit us. So we have a great chance, but we have to learn from others. There is still hope. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. We're cognizant of time here. We'll turn directly to Jim Fenlon. He's a professor of sociology and director of the Center for Indigenous People Studies at California State University, San Bernardino. His latest book, Redskins, question mark, Sports Mascots, Indian Nations, and White Racism, was written to address compelling social issues concerning Native nations, cultural sovereignty, and representation. He's co-author with Thomas D. Hall, of Indigenous Peoples and Globalization, which builds on his prior work in Culturicide, Resistance and Survival of the Lakota Sioux Nation. Professor Finland has published numerous articles and book chapters on Indigenous Peoples and Genocide and on Climate Change Wars and Indigenous Peoples. 
He's Lakota Dakota from the Standing Rock Nation and has taught internationally on urban inequality, social movements, native nations, race, and racism. He's an advocate for social justice around the world, and it's my honor to turn it over to Jim. It's a good day. Um, I am uh, honored to be here. A traditional uh, Dakota person would start off uh, by uh, saying, Hao um, Mitako Yepe, greetings to my relatives. Uh, then they would acknowledge uh, that, I want to make sure, uh, so I'm not certain what you're, well, you're probably seeing this two screen, that would be fine. Uh, then they would acknowledge that um, uh, the indigenous peoples upon whose lands we're either meeting, who have given us permission to speak, uh, in this case, I'm out where the Serrano Yahavuridam would be. Um, it also in New York, it might be the Anape or the Casarte or some of the other people. Uh, it could be where I'm actually right now, the Chemaweve people. Uh, then we would introduce ourselves, uh, and um, I would do that by, in a, if I did it also in a traditional way, uh, by um, saying Dakota Jaje Mitawakin. And that means I have been given a Dakota name, Black Spotted Horse or Black Horse uh, that was given spots. Um, then I would say, which means my father comes from the place where the rock or the, or, uh, the stone stands upright, that you would know as Standing Rock. Um, and, and therefore, I can say I am from that place or descendant from that place. Uh, my washichu shaje mitawa is James Fenelon, and I am of Dakota and Lakota, Gaelic, Irish, Viking, Gernorsk, and French descent. I live and work from uh, the indigenous homelands of the Serrano, Yohaviatam, Atongva, the Vanyume, and the Chemaweve people and descendant of the Dakota, Medewakantoa, and Lakota ancestors from Standing Rock and recognized by descendancy of Gaelic, Irish, Norsk, uh, and from uh, France. Um, uh, then we would also look at our kinds of citizenship. So uh, um, I could say I'm a citizen of Standing Rock, um, a member of a native nation, also of the United States. And I'm a veteran both of forces that have worked um, against uh, national supremacist interests. I'm also a veteran of the United States military, but I identify as a citoyen du monde with a global commitment. Um, now there are people much more knowledgeable and much greater representation, especially from Standing Rock or from Lakota and Dakota. I was just communicating with one of the great, great grandsons uh, of Gaul, one of the great leaders uh, in Ohio, and he was having a very well-known person who is actually an established and identified ambassador uh, from Standing Rock by the Tribal Council. Um, and, but I've been invited to speak, and so I asked some of the uh, elders looked at uh, uh, why I've been invited to speak. Um, and uh, then they said, uh, related to why you've been invited to speak, uh, the roots of resistance, how you relate to that, what's useful for the people, um, and uh, uh, that would be as meaningful also as a scholar, since that's probably my primary uh, external to indigenous identity now. So I grew up with my father telling us his stories about the great battles to uh, retain the Oyate, Lakota Oyate, uh, as well as the Dakota uh, ancestry, mostly out here in California. Uh, but a really compelling incident for the roots of resistance of native peoples in North American Turtle Island was the takeover at Alcatraz, which was done in the name of the 1868 treaty. Um, and this caused open revolt, even in the, a lot in the schools out here, so that we got kicked out of school. We, and that was for me, even in the ninth grade, going into the 10th grade. Uh, uh, and, and then we returned back to that when we're back at school, now we're in high school. Um, and I mean, literally uh, kicked on out. Uh, 
Uh, and so here we're talking about the nature of what is the country, especially if you are from a native nation. Dispossessor, erasure, not recognized in history, called uh, merciless savages in the Declaration of Independence. So we got kicked out again, although we like to say we left. Uh, and so um, when we did this, uh, I took off with my brother because then we were kicked out of a college. And we went uh, to visit the relatives that we had met as children multiple times at Standing Rock and also those in Bismarck and Fargo and throughout North Dakota. Uh, and we had two sets of relatives on Standing Rock. One set was heavily connected to uh, the American Indian movement and were pretty much armed. Uh, so this was, I mean, this, this was at times a shooting conflict. Uh, the other set of relatives, including the chairman at Standing Rock, uh, were with the tribal council. And they were actually military veterans, highly recognized among the people. Uh, but they were with the, uh, the so-called government, the tribal council Standing Rock. And this is one of the conflicts I may return to um, in um, uh, this talk here. Um, I'm going to skip over a lot of things. I'm going to go through a lot of international issues. I thought I had a little more time, but more importantly, I, I didn't know which things I wanted to relate to, so I put it all up there. Uh, but I did end up in the military. Both my brother and I had low draft numbers. Uh, my brother was certainly going to be drafted, so he, got, he went into the United States Army, became part of combat engineers, the first ADM teams, and so on. Um, and then from a military family, I went in uh, and ended up after going on various TDY missions and other kinds of things, um, I ended up um, on an aircraft carrier or a nuclear, I'd been on other carriers, uh, and it was the, the Nimitz when it was being made. And, and what we saw were the disposition of uh, the nuclear targets around the world, the Nimitz alone could have probably destroyed most of the urban populations on earth. And I thought, this is insanity. This is, this is the species itself. What culture or civilization produces the ability to destroy almost all of human mankind? I did get out uh, uh, with an honorable discharge, uh, uh, significant rec recognition. They gave me benefits uh, throughout that time. Um, went to a college, a university, um, Loyola Marymount, um, and decided to uh, pursue this because it was a driven element, both what is this indigenous identity within me, but also what is the struggle between war and peace? I went to the School for International Training. I'm gonna skip through these four things, but they really shaped a lot of my identity. I had a nice picture of a t-shirt that Matt recognized because we went down to a major thing in New York City that he was uh, one of the student organizers for. Um, and it, it really began to shape the thinking, but on a global level. Uh, my first internship was in Denmark. Uh, uh, won't say any more about that other than to find this relationship of people that were called the Vikingers, but uh, then managed to establish one of the most progressive societies on the face of the earth, uh, sometimes with a Christian identity. That's interesting. But especially in where Askau Foucault Escola was in Bayern, but also in, um, on the island of Amaher in Copenhagen. Um, the second internship was with the Cuban refugees Mario Boatlift, um, where you begin to see how war produces this idea of identity in peoples, including those from Taino, which is where, uh, after going back to Standing Rock um, and getting re, uh, went back for a second master's degree, this in the teaching of languages and worldviews, and went to Haiti, which is the first place where the, the, the Spanish, the Western world, uh, produces this overall conquest and a total destruction of the people, but learned a lot about resistance. The Taino uh, uh, led up on a Enriquillo, a major resistance, and later on, they had one of the most significant revolutions in the history of the world. Uh, and then was invited later on to Martinique for teacher training workshops. Uh, of course, that's where Fanon from, but I met Cesar as an old man, uh, and really focused on decolonization, other things that we need to do. We don't have time to get into this into depth, but I'm not certain if we're recording this, but people can go back and look at some of these separately. Um, after that, uh, a number of years, I went back. Uh, we're trying to get an idea. I went through a ceremony, four directions. We don't have time to get into it, but it's amazing. I, I felt my whole life unfolded by this Hayoka, who then said, you will go to the four directions of the world and tell them about us, and then you'll come back and you need to tell us about them. And that's in fact, then what happened. 
Um, uh, and then he said, be sure and understand the Ocheti Shikawin, which is where the camp where he comes. The Ocheti Shikawin is really uh, one of the most, this is a place you can go and see a whole video on it, uh, is really one of the most advanced social political organizations uh, pre-colonial that existed, I think, anywhere in the world. And I'm going to throw something even more that traditionals have said you can share uh, that's beyond that. But there were seven nations, right? And they would come together in consuls called a consul fire. And then they would learn, and I'm going to add something else that I just learned about how they did that, which is really stunning, right? But they would come together to over issues and they would reach consensus on the prevailing issues among the nations of people. Uh, if they couldn't, they would set that issue aside. So it's really advanced. Um, and in fact, uh, one of the things is how this relates to one of the greatest treaties in, in the history of our country, uh, the, um, well, see, I'm already going way past time. So I'm gonna have to go past this. I was invited to the People's Republic of China. Uh, and there I met uh, indigenous peoples on Hainan Dao uh, and in the mountain people. And the next year uh, I was invited to Tokyo, Japan, and met Ainu and Koreans. In Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, we met with the Ron Asli in the north and went to Sarawak, uh, met with Iban people still living in their households and so on. Um, and, and each of this, we began to see regular uh, kinds of things, uh, but I was either poisoned or somehow my health was, you know, uh, and so I came back uh, and uh, Mine Wichone, which became a calling card of Standing Rock, um, uh, uh, brought me back to health. I mean, it was actually, I had cancer and this kind of thing would kill me and that kind of thing. Even at UCLA, they said, whoa, you got a lot going on. All disappeared when I returned back. Uh, and so here are some of the concepts, especially unchi ina maka that you would say in ceremony, or the earth, my mother, grandmother earth, but also mini wachone, the healing properties of water, and then the nature of relationships Kola Lechea, that you would say in ceremony, but also to Tunkashila um, uh, as the grandfather or the ancestors that we call upon. Uh, we did a set of studies. We talked to the people in the destruction of the Missouri Riverine areas, which is a part of what the standoff was about. Um, and these three or four elders, this is Reginald Birdhorse, talked about the loss of their lands. This is Henry Swifthorse. He passed away. People said, why is he staying on? And he passed away right after this. Uh, and he, he talked about the importance of remembering the land and remembering the struggle of the people upon the land and their spirituality and the relationship to the earth. And this was given to the Senate Indian Affairs Committee um, and all kinds of issues about sovereignty came out of that. Uh, this is uh, the third person, the third elder that I'm allowed to talk about. And his name is Vernon Ironcloud. I'm, he's, he's still alive, very old. Um, uh, and uh, also then the repulse at Medicine Tail Cooley which is a defense of the people and the nation. Uh, was uh, ran some programs at the college here for a while, then it was called Standing Rock College, and the relationship of the traditional, uh, 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 the traditional, for instance, a feather bonnet, which was a civic, was along with uh, books and so on. Um, and, and then was asked to give a humanities lecture, and so I did, and it caused a furor because the ghost dance, the very famous one that leads to the killings of Wounded Knee, was in fact a really nonviolent quasi-Christian thing. And yet we look at the response of the military, the killing of the people, the wiping out, and then the banning of ceremonies, it made the Sundance illegal, Indian Offenses Act. They went out to burn pipes. They wanted to really destroy the essence of the people. Um, and, and yet somehow the people kept this, these things alive. This was in the 1930s, a picture that was thought to be impossible. When I presented it later um, at Harvard, uh, they got into a big argument, but luckily we had pictures. There it is, my friends, there it is. Um, and so just moving along, this is, the, the, you know, we don't, we don't want to spend too much time on that, but you want to look at how the dominant society enjoys, you know, its domination, even in a kill site, even the expression. Then I went to Cleveland, uh, we had to deal with the Cleveland Indians. You heard one of those books said there. Um, uh, uh, then that kind of forced me out here to California, which was a good thing. We looked more at genocide. Uh, and then one of the most amazing things is that uh, genocide uh, is uh, been a comprehensive policy attack here. So I'm going to just move through the rest of these. So each of the books that I have written here actually are based on these sets of experience that I've had, some of which I was charged with. Um, uh, or then so I say, then we went internationally, but I have to go over this. 
Uh, we met Worley people with resistance meetings in their forest lands where they're regenerating teak forests, right? To have their sense of community, their sense of land. We met Gond elders um, that they're actually protecting their medicinal ways from attack from pharmaceutical companies. Um, and uh, then in Mexico, we went to both Oaxaca and Chiapas um, and learned of the movement there in the sense of the struggle with the dominant society, also destroying uh, their ways of life. And yet everywhere we went, we ran into this as a kind of model. And then met with some people at Ovantique, the Zapatistas, uh, and um, uh, the importance uh, of what they were doing in terms of a global model for all the world. Uh, and here are the four things that we found all indigenous peoples are dealing with. Um, and that is, they all are establishing and protecting a sense of community. Their economy is almost always redistributive. It's, um, uh, and it's a shared wealth. It has a social value. Land often has a sacred relationship for a station. And decision making is, seems to be almost always based on a sense of uh, consensus and um, coming together, which is I really have to thank the two previous speakers. Um, in order to get to the model that I'm at right here, and I'll just skip through this stuff, I apologize for time. Uh, I first went with the Bedouin in the Negev and learned about the Palestinian struggle, but especially the Bedouin as the indigenous peoples. Um, then I was asked back years later, right when Standing Rock was starting on up, and, and uh, we observed that they're, they're experiencing a military occupation, not unlike the Indian reservations of the 1800s, and it was also very violent. I came back and Standing Rock was heating on up. I had to teach, um, and especially at the Sacred Stone Camp, a sense of community, health of the people, a story you probably know well, maybe you were there. Uh, and then a sense of, uh, and then thank you for the last set of words, fighting against the capitalist orientation, in this case, in oil pipeline, um, uh, and everything that the people would represent. Uh, uh, later on, there was up to 10,000 people, but these camps were set on up, and they were called Ocheti Sakawin to call on that ancient concept. The amazing thing is that the military checkpoints that I had experienced in the West Bank were now on the road down to Standing Rock. They blocked the road and they said, you know what the Indians are doing down there? So you'd go around and then five days later, I come back and the police had been replaced with National Guard. They're clearly making this in set of a references to as if they're Indian wars, right? Um, and then these are some of the things I've been referring to here. Uh, and uh, then this is the kind of struggle uh, with the allies in the sense of going up against the movement um, and especially this picture because the water protectors saw it as a sense of sacrifice. And anybody that's been in the military has seen this. This is rolled razor, this is rolled concertina wire. Why do they need to station these troops with the water cannons against these people? They're not going through that wire. So there's a sense uh, of an ancient historical set of conflicts as well. Uh, and there, this is one of the pictures I took. This is uh, the traditional elder. This is Face Spotted Eagle, of course, that's the famous Winona Leduc. And the three, the, 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 the generations uh, of uh, women being able to lead, which is, did most of the leadership initially out at Standing Rock. Um, and then just moving beyond, of course, it was a violent suppression. If we had more time, we could get into that. The Native Nations and Rising that was supported by Standing Rock to represent all Native Nations. Um, and then the, the, the sense of all the spirituality and its relationship to earth and movement and people, both the Chanupa, always taken out in a respectful way, um, but also to go through purification ceremonies before taking part in representing the community. And again, that same picture. So really, um, I uh, want to briefly share this. I apologize for the time, um, but uh, this is not written down anywhere that I know of. Uh, but uh, this, there were four elders that we spoke with. One continues, that's Mary Louise Defender. There were actually not seven nations in the original ancient Ojeti Sakawi. There were seven in each of four directions, and some of them the historians and the anthropologists call warring nations, right? And yet we know that they came together in an ancient Ojeti Sakawi to have council fires in agreement on a shared idea of what was happening to the earth and the people and community. So here, are at least six in each of the four directions. Um, and uh, the sense at Standing Rock was to, um, uh, you know, uh, resemble this idea of the coming together of nations 
in a good way. Here's the other thing that I have to share with you. Sometimes we look at the traditional form among the Lakota people, and I just learned this, okay? Because I call back again uh, to the one person I still talk with a lot, um, who's very cogent. And uh, I talked about the participation. She goes, we don't know how they selected people to go to these council fires. But we talked about how they came to agreement, which is an amazing thing, especially between people that might do war. By the way, the, the 28, I think, is most like the United Nations. That's what it's most like, the coming together of nations in a good way. And then she said an amazing thing. Oh, no, they practice true consensus. They would come together and they would ask these questions. I have it also in Dakota. Uh, they would uh, uh, They would ask um, when they had agreed on that some, it looked like they had agreement. They would ask, uh, 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 do you agree with this? And everyone would either say yes, how, or uh -huh, or huh, which is what they would often say. But if some didn't, instead of them being negative, they would re-ask the question in a different way uh, but they would say, um, well, then, uh, is it that you can't come to agreement? That way, they never say no. They never take an oppositional position. This is an amazing thing. If we think of how nations can come together so that no one is forced to be oppositional, there's still a way for them to come together. And we think this uh, probably gave them their strength, their sovereignty, um, and they will, yes, or how, or a very complicated, uh-huh, uh, um, Anyway, that's what I have to share with you, those two things. Here's Mary Louise. She's the one that said, yes, I can use her name. She just shared that. She was one of four elders. There's another one still alive um, among the Dakota that knew this ancient way. Um, and, and then here out in California, which I told some of the wonderful organizers of the great uh, meetings that they had out in Massachusetts, work I've been doing for about 20 years. Here is my friend that just went to the spirit world uh, Luke Madrigal, and he could sing all the old songs. In fact, this is the very famous James Ramos, not only from, um, uh, well, he's also the state assembly person. He would actually defer and ask for uh, if he was singing it the right way. That's how strong Madrigal was in terms of representing the people in the ancient ways here, uh, which is where many of these stories came from. If you want to see how we have figured out a way to, this is called the Envisioning Indigenous Models for Social and Ecological Change in the Anthropocene. We think we've come up with a way to actually do this uh, uh, using Indigenous models, which as Chomsky has said, is really the only, almost the only hope of the world, is that it's Indigenous peoples that have a model that could actually save the world. And I'm sharing with you what we have uh, here. So uh, it's a coming together of nations, uh, like at San Manuel, James Ramos was famous from. And now we see this has just happened in LA, toppling of the Columbus as a metaphor myth, right? So what is this metaphor of domination versus Jim. resistance of the people? I'm finishing up right here. In fact, this is the final slide here. So I'm calling on, in that sense of that resistance of nations of people, we're calling on the spirits to honor the earth and the people who live on Turtle Island. Doksha Mitakawe Yasin, thank you very much. And we got to get out of stop sharing. Wow. I I I, uh, I hate even to do the disrespect of saying your name uh, while you're talking because uh, I, I just want to hear uh, more and more, and that goes for the other speakers before you as well. I want uh, more than two hours with each of you, and there's way more than that uh, wisdom to to impart, and there's so much for us to learn. But uh, I, I was also anxious for us to get to our final speaker uh, and maybe even have some time for some Q&A uh, because I've known of this person, then I've known this person and I continue to, uh, to be inspired by uh, the work of our final speaker, uh, Dr. Kelly T. Maharawa. Uh, I, I'm gonna apologize for mispronouncing, uh, so please correct me uh, when you start, but uh, but Kelly uh, is the director of Maori research at Otega Polytechnic in uh, Etiara, New Zealand. Uh, she's a co-editor of a recent uh, Springer book, Peace Building and the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Experiences and Strategies for the 21st Century. She has published extensively on Maori education initiatives, cultural revitalization, and indigenous peace traditions. Kelly is the great granddaughter of Te Maharari, a Maori prophet from Te Wapu Namu, 
the South Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand. She served on the board of the Asia Pacific Research Association as, and as an executive and council member of the International Peace Research Association. She's a dynamic researcher uh, as well as activist organizer, as well as friend and person. Dr. Kelly, it's uh, such an honor to have you with us. Oh, kia ora. Kia ora, kia ora ana. Warm Pacific greetings to you all and to the indigenous people of the land on which we rest. May your sacred spiritual being, language, culture and identity be recognized, valued and affirmed. A special greetings to our sisters and brothers from throughout the world that have gathered today as to support the international peace community, to my fellow presenters, and especially to my friends, Matt Mayer and Polly Walker, who have called us here today. Tēnā koutou katoa, greetings to you all. Ko Auraki toku mauka, ko Waipaki toku awa, ko Uruau toku waka, ko Rākai hautu o ko Kai hautu, ko Waitaha toku iwi, ko Te Mai Horoa toku takata, ko Kelly Te Mai Horoa ahau. Just as Jim introduced himself and, and, and our fellow speakers have as well in, in their indigenous tongue. So Auraki is my mountain, Waitaki is my river, Urua was my canoe, Rakai Hotu was our navigator, Waitaha is my tribe, Tamaihoroa is my ancestor, and my name is Kelly Tamaihoroa. In an effort to share with you the genesis of my ancestral roots of resistance. I started with my tribal mihi mihi or formal introduction. I descend from Rakai Hautu, a great navigator of the Pacific Ocean, who was our first tribal Waitaha person to reach Te Waiponamu, the South Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand, around 850 AD. I am here because of him, some 67 generations later, and my great-great-grandfather to my horoa, as um, Matt suggested, was the last prophet and expert priest of the South Island in the mid to late 18th century. Our nation of Aotearoa New Zealand is founded on Te Treaty of Waitangi, a treaty agreed and signed between 550 Māori chiefs and representatives of the British Crown in 1840. Like many treaties drawn up around the time of early colonial contact, this treaty was written in the indigenous language in this case, Te Reo Māori, the Māori language. While there is much debate here in Aotearoa about the differences in translation between the two treaties, it is accepted in international law that the indigenous language is privileged and upheld as a legally binding text, obviously because it represents the understanding of the indigenous people at the time of signing. Whilst Māori were overwhelmingly the dominant population for the first decades after signing the treaty, by the 1870s, Māori no longer held the balance of power and we quickly became minorities within our own land. With the huge loss of land and economic base, Māori were soon unable to equally participate in the strange foreign ways of economics and politics from afar. Māori from across tribes, across Aotearoa, petitioned local authorities, the government of the day, and even the Queen of England about ongoing treaty violations. Resistance, resistance lives where injustice grows. We are protectors, not protesters. We protect the right to live as indigenous people, to speak our ancient language, to practice our cultural rituals and ancestral customs of our people. It is here that the roots of my resistance are grounded. My great-great-grandfather, Tamaihoroa, was the leading South Island chief of this time and he witnessed the devastating changes during the mid 18th century. Tamai Horoa was a scholar skilled in both Māori and English language. As an advocate for Southern Māori, he raised concerns, concerns about the treaty breaches to local authorities, government, even writing to the Queen of England. European squatters were squatting on his, on, sorry, European settlers were squatting on land that he had personal title of and he was also concerned for his people due to the impact of disease and potential loss of Māori language and culture. Tamai Horoa held the view, along with many other South Island chiefs of that time, that the interior of the West Coast and South Island remained Māori land. In an effort to protect his people and assert authority over ancestral hinterland, 
to my Horoa led a migration of up to 600 people into the mountains of the South Island. This indigenous peace movement is known as Te Heke Ki Te Ao Marama, the migration to the promised land of 1877 to 1879. After two years of living peacefully in their village, the Crown evicted Mai Horoa and his followers, leaving us essentially later landless natives in our own land that we had reigned over for over a thousand years. Despite ongoing protests since 1844 to the New Zealand government, the British government and the Queen of England, the rights of Māori as the indigenous people of this land were largely ignored. For much of the 20th century, the Treaty of Waitangi had been swept aside and almost forgotten about. Then as part of the worldwide indigenous people's rights movement, Māori united in a landmark to pr bring treaty issues to public attention in 1975. It was at this time that the Waitangi Tribunal was established to investigate treaty breaches. So what does this mean for Indigenous peacemaking in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and my role in the roots of my resistance? Māori have never surrendered sovereignty to the Crown. As discussed previously, Māori raised and continued to raise Crown breaches since 1844. Māori rights and responsibilities, we are caretakers of our islands, not only land, water, sea and resources, but we also claim rights to protect our for flora, fauna and intellectual property. The Crown limited historical treaty claims to be submitted by 2008, and there are ongoing contemporary claims being laid due to ongoing inequity between Māori and non-Māori. For my iwi, for my tribe, the Waitaha tribe of the South Island, our people gathered together in the 1980s in order to engage with the Crown. I was a teenager at this time. This required us to formalise ourselves into a company and a trust board. Waitaha launched an historical claim in 2008 in an effort to engage with the Crown as stipulated by the Crown. Our claim highlighted Crown treaty breaches against Waitaha the First Nations people of this land and the losses suffered by our people and continue to suffer. We started this formalised process almost 40 years ago and are yet to have our initial application accepted by the Crown. The Crown holds the balance of power. They determine whether we have a case or not. We have submitted over 13 different claims and each time the Crown responds with preventative legislation and request for further information. This has had a detrimental effect on our elders who have passed away fighting the good fight and the potential of our mokopuna, our grandchildren of tomorrow, as the politics of distraction draws our time and energy away from our families, away from the well-being of our people and opportunities for our people to flourish. The responsibility to right the wrongs of the past, to carry on the work that our ancestors started, rests on our shoulders. I'm the co-claimant for the Waitaha Treaty Claim with my 87-year-old aunt and to my Horoa Dodds. Together, we've got this. There's a traditional saying, he kākanoa ho, I am a seed born of greatness. As children of Rākai Hotu, we carry on the long line of chiefs the expression of our ancestors, eternal energetic being, beings. We are destined for these experiences to hold on to the energy and the light of our ancestors, even during these current challenging times. Everything has a vibrational frequency, and although we are small, we are an important tribe in the context of the first people to call this island home. We hold what we call here mana wairua, mana whenua, the spiritual power of this land. We never gave up our mana, our authority, our right to determine our own lives and to maintain our traditional ways of living and being. We follow the ancient trails of our ancestors to live our lives in peace, proud to descend from a long line of peacemakers, peacekeepers, pacifists. Another saying we have is he fai fai tonu mato. We will always strive for social justice. This is, the this is the roots of our resistance. 
In summary, even though our world is changing, Indigenous people have not forgotten our divine links to being heavenly celestial beings. Metaphysical science is now catching, catching up on Indigenous knowledge systems. We have the ability to change our thinking, to change our outcomes, to manifest a more peaceful, equitable world. In every case, we all have the ability to focus energy that creates worlds. The world is facing enormous challenges right now, which makes it hard for us to stay in love with life, especially when others are suffering all around us. We have chosen this time to live on this planet in amongst times of great upheaval and unrest. It is our role to hold on to the collective vision of peace and justice, to show people alternative ways of hope and healing, to lead our people towards wholeness and show others a place of wholeness. Let us turn our face toward the sun so that the shadows of the past fall behind us. Nor reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Therefore, I greet you once, I greet you twice, I greet you three times. Mā tōa gali ere gāne. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful for the words that you have shared with us. We are now going to open it up to questions from the people who've been with us on this journey this evening. I would ask if you have questions, could you please put them in the chat and perhaps then the speakers can see which ones they might wish to respond to. We also have uh, little time uh, because we had uh, really four extraordinary uh, presentations and I, I feel like we want to hear more from each of you and, and we'll have to make time to do that and IPRA, uh, IPRA is honored by, by all that you've shared. So if uh, some of you, uh, like me, are kind of uh, speechless and questionless because we're still taking in and digesting uh, these extraordinary uh, histories and uh, ideas. Uh, please know that the short time we have together now, another 15 minutes, is not indicative of the time that we'll spend together uh, as a group uh, beyond this particular container uh, because uh, IPRA and, and our regional associations will uh, not only provide more containers with this, but also conversations amongst these panelists and uh, uh, and those people who are here today. So uh, I don't want to look to an end, but uh, I'm also speaking to give people the chance to think of their questions. Who would like to step forward? I don't have a uh, question, but I would like to say Lili Wajtelo, uh, the, uh, how excellent these pre the, my other presenters have been, and you, Secretary General Meyer, Matt, <laughs> Professor Walker, Polly, um, and I want to say, Pidamaya, thank you for putting this together, but more importantly for you, each of you that works in peace, Wopila, honor to you for the work you do. I would like to say, I'm again, not a question, but I'm struck by the resonances uh, amongst everyone about the four, about the holism and consensus of the four, of the natural world, of the spirit world, of our embodied nature and our emotions and connections. And I, I could hear those resonances in, in each different presentation. An ancient mandala that we seem to share. I guess I want to, so they're not the, the final words. Uh, I want to insert in here a couple of uh, maybe bookkeeping pieces, uh, though not uh, purely administrative, uh, also uh, maybe a certain interpersonal or spiritual bookkeeping. Um, for those who don't know, uh, IPRA, I'm very proud of the association that I was recently elected to, uh, or fairly recently elected to lead. 
Uh, it was the first major international peace uh, association of any type, research or otherwise, uh, to elect uh, as one of its uh, secretary generals uh, an African colleague. And this is something that <coughs> and I were both part of, a Sierra Leonean uh, colleague who's now actually a, a fairly uh, high level leader in the Sierra Leonean education system uh, of that country. Uh, was our first uh, secretary general, was the first secretary general or, or president of any uh, major international peace uh, NGO uh, from Africa. But I also want to say uh, that uh, Marite and Marcella uh, from Latin America have been pioneers of an ongoing initiative uh, called the New Normalcy and the idea that we never can return uh, to a new post-COVID normal uh, that looks like the old normal, that we have to uh, build now uh, towards something uh, more human and, and humane. And, uh, and finally, I I'll say that uh, IPRA is planning our next major conference in January of 2021, January 11 to 15, 2021. Uh, it will be held in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, and uh, there will be an in-person part of it, uh, but there also will be online and uh, web-based ways of participating. So uh, we will be happy to send all of you information uh, about that. And we hope you join us in January, if not in person, then virtually, uh, because that's another time when we'll be coming together. I think now I've done all of the administrative bookkeeping uh, things, and now there's a whole bunch of questions and comments, and I'll let Polly uh, take us through those. So, so I would encourage, um, I'd like to give a chance for each of your speakers to answer a question that resonates with you. So if you could look in your chat box and see a question that, that you really feel compelled or moved to answer, and I would love to hear from each of you before we close, at least once. Awesome. I'll start us off. Um, <laughs> the younger generation speaking here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I just put in the chat box. Um, Kia whakatomori, te haere whakamua. I walk backwards into the future. And this is, um, we call it a whakatoki or a saying um, that is, connects us um, with our tipuna and our past, our ancestors and our past for um, our future. So I guess it's in terms of that spiritual world as well. We're always bringing those that have gone, that are um, energetic beings that remain with us and into our future. So yeah, that's a little cool little. Matt, is there a question? Is there a question you would like to answer? Yeah, I was just looking at the, the comments made, and there's just something that um, excites me as, as the last one that says indigenous views, what according to you, that's not to me though, on the state and sovereignty of a territory. Let me not talk about the territory. Let me talk about my country, uh, Nigeria. I think I have a problem. We are getting seriously, seriously westernized, and there's so much the intrusion of Western ways of life into our system. And therefore, that makes it impossible for us to handle communal, communal clashes and conflicts the way we used to handle them before. And because of that, there is never a clear-cut solution. In fact, there's, there's no real solution. There's no resolution to conflicts in many parts of Africa, especially Nigeria. And the problem with that is that uh, we, are, we are slowly losing our identity because we are becoming so westernized. And that scares me a lot because things I could discuss with my wife or with my family or with my community, I cannot do them anymore because there's an intrusion of this Western uh, 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 idiosyncrasy. So I don't know how it's going to be in the next five, 10, 15 years. But if it's going the way it's been going now, then we have a problem. And I think it's, it, it's something we should call upon all Africans to begin to look inwards for their own development, not expect development to come from without. And that's a big problem for us. Thank you, Matt. 
Adriana and Marcella, is there a question you'd like to speak to? Yeah, I think Adriana is wanting to, to answer to two different questions. First, the one that asked about the past and the lies before us. And Adriana says that she thinks uh, that it is uh, fundamental to to make visible our resistance and uh, to make visible that we are existing humans and not just in museums as an as old cultures that disappears, but that we are living here and now and that we claim for attention and the guarantee of our rights in, as an individual and as a collective. And that's why it's precise to generate space for reconstruction of history, not just uh, by the ones that won, but also uh, but, uh, but us. And I would like to comment and to add a little bit to that in regarding something that just happened this week on Colombia, in this area where Adriana comes from. And uh, the indigenous community, the Misak indigenous community made a trial on Sebastián de Belalcázar, that was one of the founders of the cities of Quito and Cali and other cities here in Latin America. And uh, effectively, they found him guilty of, uh, well, of murdering all these uh, native people. Uh, and uh, they took out the statue that was actually over as a uh, sacred space for them. So now there's a huge debate about all of this, about the past and the lies and who tells the story and how to revindicate um, our memories. And I think Adrian is preparing for answer the other one regarding to FARC, but not yet ready, so. Okay, well, while she's working on that one, I'll ask Jim if there's a question he would like to respond to. ¿Puedo, ¿Puedo decir algo más, Marcelita? Sí, claro. Ah, bueno, es que eh, respecto a la primera pregunta sobre que nombrás lo, lo, del, lo de los MISAC o lo que hemos hecho recientemente los pueblos, es que yo creo que si en nuestro país, en Colombia, la gente que reaccionó frente al patrimonio cultural inerte, asimismo reaccionara frente a la muerte, de cada persona, este país sería un poco distinto, porque quizás nos piensan a los indígenas de museo, pero no nos piensan en la calle y como aquellos que proveemos aún la comida que llega cada día a la mesa. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Gracias, Adriana. So she says that uh, because because of things that happened during the weekend, there's a lot of debate in Colombia and stuff, and there's a lot of people uh, claiming uh, that the patrimony is, um, yeah, that, yeah, that uh, it, this is a violent action and that we need to prosecute uh, these indigenous people for uh, taking this statue. And what Adriana says, says is that if people uh, get angry for this as uh, if they will get angry for the murder and prosecution and uh, that the, all these massacres we have in Colombia today as the way they, they get angry because of this statue. Maybe we have in Colombia different countries. And this link with uh, what she said before that the indigenous people is not, they're not dead in museums. They're alive in the streets claiming for, for their rights. So we need to see them as that. Mm -hmm. Respondo la de las FARC. La que tú me hacías. ¿Me estás lista? Dale. Sí. Eh, bueno, me preguntan sobre cómo ha contribuido las FARC. Yo creo que una de las cosas de pensar en Colombia es que primero nuestra historia no arranca con las guerrillas. Nuestra historia arranca con la resistencia campesina en defensa de la tierra. Arranca con la, con la lucha frente a la tenencia de la tierra en pocas manos y la necesidad de distribuir esa tierra. Por lo tanto, ese es un valor que no hemos perdido. <laughs> Dame chance de traducir, sigue, sigue, sigue. Uh, so, as I was regarding this uh, FARC question, that it's important to recognize that the story of the of their people of in Cauca, the Yanacona people and the indigenous people in Colombia doesn't start with the guerrillas. It's a very, very, very long story that uh, starts with the 
claim for territory, for the property, for uh, liberating the territory that is in such um, little hands. Sí, dale, dale. Bueno, entonces nuestra historia está basada en el, o sea, la historia del pueblo colombiano en general está basada en el despojo y la tenencia en pocas manos. Y nosotros como indígenas de distintos pueblos hemos resistido. Los grupos guerrilleros aparecieron y aparecieron intentando dañarnos el alma y el corazón porque han reclutado, han masacrado, han violado han traficado a nuestras comunidades y a nuestras mujeres, niños y niñas. No solo las FARC, muchos otros. Los paramilitares, los militares. Dame chance. Uh, so it's important to also to remember that the story of Colombia is a story of dispossession. Our state is built on, on this dispossession of the native groups. So the, the apparition of guerrillas is quite late, but uh, they they're appear claiming for the rights of the people, even though they also hurt the people because they violated, the, they re recruit young people. Reclutamiento, reclutamiento, uh -huh. yes. Young people from the communities to make them part of their armies. So they've been doing so much harm as well to all the people in indigenous in Colombia. Entonces, esas, esas violencias en nuestros cuerpos han hecho que nosotros concibamos el cuerpo y la tierra como nuestro territorio. Y es lo que defendemos de forma pacífica. Y es lo que queremos que no solamente los gobernantes entiendan, sino también los inversionistas. Porque aquí no se trata de ver al gobierno como malo. Ni a, ni a los inversionistas como malos, sino que entiendan que son pueblos que resistimos en nuestra ancestralidad, de nuestras prácticas. So, this uh, particular, particular violence is uh, established on their bodies and on, on their lands. That's why it's such a such important thing to recognize the strong uh, pacific resistance they have and not only the resistance against, the, let's say, the government, but also the people that invest and the companies that wants, wants to invest in, in Colombia and, and how do this um, vinculate with uh, the, Pacific, the Pacific resistances of them. Y por lo tanto, por el hecho de ser indígenas, hemos pasado de la vergüenza al orgullo, Marcelita, esto es muy importante para nosotros porque nos han intentado sentir vergüenza. Indios sucios, indios brutos, indios patichorreados, no so somos indios que queremos que el mundo entienda, todos las grandes corporaciones que no pueden seguir matando a nuestra madre. Colombia es uno de los países que más proyectos mineros extractivistas tiene ahora en el mundo. Y queremos entonces tratar de defender a nuestra madre tierra de ese proyecto. Por algo nos juntamos también con el movimiento de liberación de la madre tierra. Mm, ok. <laughs> so this is a... Um, this de la vergüenza al orgullo. Uh, it's really important for Adriana and, and her people that they have come from shame to pride. Because all this time people have been saying to them that they're, they're gross, they're uh, um, dirty, that they cannot deal with themselves, that they're little childs maybe. So now this time is a time of pride for them. And that's why they came um, with all these strong forces and uh, this other movement, libera Liberación de la Madre Tierra, Lands Liberation Movement, that is very important because they're claiming lands back for the people and they're making the resistance in Colombia that is one of the most um, um, we have uh, a lot a lot a lot of um, projects about extractivism in, in, here in our lands so this is a huge issue for us and for the people y sabemos que entonces hay un proyecto de, de asesinar sistemáticamente no me lo estoy inventando las cifras lo demuestran 
hay un proyecto sistema, de matar sistemáticamente a nuestros líderes y lideresas. Y nosotros en comunidad estamos tratando de mostrar otras formas de resistencia, inclusive a través del canto, de la ritualidad, de la palabra. Estamos tratando de desarmar el discurso de los medios de comunicación. Estamos tratando de desarmar el corazón, pero nos está costando mucho, porque nos está costando muchos muertos. Ok, creo que tenemos que terminar ya. con esto. Sí, tranquila, ya. So, um, so it's not, it's not uh, the idea, it's not uh, a delirium that uh, they are killing us, and they are killing us, and there's the numbers, and there you can check on this. So this is very important for us to transform the ways uh, the people see our resistance and to change and the resistance to existence in the world, in the world, in the, in the everyday life. So, yeah. I would like to, thank you. Yes, I, I would like to close us out saying, Wado, Gadielega, thank you. I'm very grateful for all of your passion, your knowledge, your commitment, and your resistance that is leading us toward balance and harmony. And I would like to issue the invitation for us to find ways to stay in touch and to support each other's work in solidarity. May we all go in peace. Gracias. Paz y justicia. Bye bye, everybody. Love and solidarity. Abrazos. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Peace. Gracias, Matt. Peace. Abrazos. Okay, Matt. Peace. Abrazos. Gracias. Okay. Adiós.